Okay, I, uh, I don't know if it's a host for the session, but given that we're stuck at 11.30, I don't want to run too late, so I'll introduce myself. Um, so I'm Simon Byrne, I'm the uh, lead software engineer on the Klima project, um, so I'm at Caltech. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Sorry. No. I was, thought I had this mic. Okay, I'll speak on this mic, that's easier. Is that better? Okay, I'm the uh, lead software engineer on the Klima project at Caltech. Uh, so I'll explain a bit about what that is. I'm not sure what that is. Oh, it's in the hallway. Okay, checking my computer wasn't playing something. Okay, um, so who and what is Klima? Uh, so it's a collaboration between Caltech, uh, MIT, and JPL. Uh, we're developing an Earth system model uh, in Julia, um, primarily targeting uh, modern HPC hardware, namely GPUs. Um, the primary aim is you want to be able to learn from data. So by data we mean uh, either generated sort of high resolution simulations uh, or target, uh, so that are specific local or you know, systematically collected satellite observations. Um, and the fundamental aim of the project is we want to be able to reduce uncertainty in future climate model uh, modeling predictions. Uh, and so, we have some very spons kind sponsors who uh, have kept us going, and I'm very grateful for that. Um, but quick crash course in what an Earth system model is. Um, basically, it's a numerical model of the planet. Um, I guess numerical physical model of the planet, maybe I should say. Uh, so it, capture, it tries to capture a whole bunch of different stuff, and I'm going to skip over a huge amount of here. Uh, so there's two big fluids, I guess you'd say. There's the atmosphere and the ocean, which are moving around stuff on a sphere. Um, there's a bunch of thermodynamics in there, moisture and phase changes and things like that. There's radiation, um, so stuff coming from the sun, different wavelengths of light that get absorbed to the Earth and also get re-emitted back to space. Uh, there's a whole uh, huge amount of subgrid scale things. So basically stuff we can't resolve at the model resolution that we have to be able to capture. Um, big things, and these are really important things. So, and these are sort of the things we're trying to figure out how to do better. So things like clouds and convection and turbulence. And there's a whole lot more. Um, so there's land, there's water runoff, there's sea ice, biosphere, um, all these sorts of things. But the fundamental aim we ultimately care about is what's called the energy balance. So basically, is the amount of energy in our Earth system increasing or increasing? Because that determines the rate. More energy means more heat, that's going up. So that's ultimately the sort of, you know, at the end of the day, that's what, what happens. Um, so particularly, I'm, I mean, I ended up sort of working on the sort of more on the atmospheric modeling side. Um, so there's a talk by Oceanigans and there's a whole session this afternoon on uh, Earth system models, including some of my collaborators, um, and particularly Oceanigans and a couple of people, a couple of us. Uh, but the particular thing I've ended up working on mostly is the atmospheric modeling. Um, and some interesting things that make the, what makes this interesting, it's very, it's a very, Slightly odd problem numerically. So you have a very skewed aspect ratio. So the resolution of an atmosphere, of a atmospheric model is basically somewhere around 10 kilometers. You know, depending on how big your supercomputer is, you can throw at this. Um, you know, this talk we're getting down to one kilometer or so, but still, that's a huge gap. You know, very coarse considering all the stuff that's going on. Um, whereas in the vertical, you know, you tend to have a much higher resolution, somewhere tens or hundreds of meters. Um, and so what that means is that, you know, I guess in numerical balance you have different CFL conditions. So basically the rate at which information travels in the vertical can be very different than horizontal. Um, and often you end up even using very completely different numerical schemes in the vertical and horizontal. Um, so in particular our approach, we use a sort of spectral element approach and a horizontal finite volume in the vertical. And you end up to, but this does have some advantages. Um, so you can use what are known as horizontally explicit and vertically implicit time stepping schemes, which basically means you do sort of implicit time stepping in, one, in the vertical, but fully explicit in the horizontal. And why that's nice is because then when you want to distribute your work, you can distribute just horizontally um, and you sort of, it limits the amount of communication you need to do between your different processes um, because you only have to do the explicit, which is much simpler to do. Um, there's a whole bunch of other stuff that goes on. There's, we typically use staggered grids because they have some very nice numerical properties. Um, and parameterize, there's a whole, as I mentioned earlier, there's a whole sort of stuff of other stuff that goes on there, parameterizations and closures to capture these subgrid scale things. Okay, um, so I'm, this is 
we've been going a while now. Um, the uh, so we've got a whole. We use a lot of Julia. There's a whole sort of ecosystem we've built around. Um, I'm going to talk about one very tiny box called Clima Core, and even then I'm only talking about a tiny aspect of it. Um, but yeah, we've, we've been at this while. We've got a, we've had to build a lot of stuff, um, and it's you know we've used Julia very heavily. Uh, so Clima Core, um, it's basically how I describe it is a toolkit for building spatial discretizations for uh, system models. Um, and so the way to think about it is by spatial discretization, it's like how we approximate stuff in space as opposed to how we approximate stuff in time. Um, and so we do it by a sequence of steps. The first thing is you just sort of define a domain. So e.g. a sphere, that's the place you're, on the space on which you're working. Um, you define a mesh on that domain, which sort of breaks up, your, um, breaks up into um, what we call elements or cells or whatever term you want to use. Um, and from beyond that, you then, we can add sort of another layer on top of that, which we call topology. This is really sort of more of a numerical thing, but basically it orders and partitions the elements. And so this is sort of when you actually sort of start break down doing distributed computing, this become, you need this to say how, where, what's connected to what, how does information get passed between those things. Um, then we add, define the, one more thing, another thing called a space. So a space is, I guess, we use the term space because the analogy is a mathematical, it's a vector space. Uh, but basically, the idea is that that's the sort of the, la the di how we actually discretize the whole thing. So we stick, um, we put physical nodes, um, physical locations on the thing. So they're the, we call nodes, which are like the places where you have data. Um, we compute a bunch of like spatial geometric information, like how far things are apart, some, a you know, bunch of partial derivative terms, things like that. And then once you have that, you can define a field. So a field is basically at every one of those nodes, you have a value. And that gives you sort of a, you think of it as like a, an approximation of a function of your domain, sort of. Well, it's a, it is a function of the domain. It's that belongs to a very specific class as opposed to, you know, that we can discretize. Um, and so we can do that sequentially and the field then becomes sort of the fundamental, well, maybe one of the fundamental objects that you work with. Uh, so the way to think of a field, you can think of a different aspects. So one is a function of a domain. Another way is to think of it as an array with a bunch of geometric information we shove in there. Um, so, you know, the element type, it can have an element type. Um, so if it's a number, you have a scalar field. If it's a vector, you have a vector field. Um, these are, make it easy. We support broadcasting. So if you want to do operations, you know, apply a function pointwise on a field. So to define that one previously, it's a sort of a spherical harmonic. We uh, just define those. You define a coordinate field that give you a latitude and a longitude, and then you can define a function based on that. Uh, we define sum. So sum here isn't just the sum of the values, it's sort of an approximate of the integral. So it's the sum times the uh, quadrature weights times Jacobian terms, so things like this. Um, and the idea is meant to be a very high level abstraction. So we wanna build things, so the idea is that we build something that climate scientists can use without having to get delve into the deep, thing, a bunch of deep numerical and um, complicated code pieces. Um, so the one thing that, so, so what makes this work is, so, What's really important though, and I guess the crux is what I'm gonna focus this talk on is what I call operators. So what is an operator? Um, and basically you can think of it as like a local operation, neighborhood operation, I guess is a sort of hand wave here. But the big one is obviously differential operators. So your grad, your div, your curl. Um, so things that involve derivatives, spatial derivatives. Um, it also includes other things like interpolation and re, uh, reconstruction or like upwinding operations that often you end up using in numerical schemes. Um, and they're very space dependent. So in a, the finite difference or a finite volume scheme, it's typically based on some sort of window around, you know, a gradient is, or a, some differential operator is based on some window around particular areas. In a spectral element scheme, um, we use a, it's based on a polynomial basis within a single element. Um, we also have a bunch of other stuff which I'm not gonna talk about. So there's like weak form and strong form operators and DSS, which is a, you know, Golikan approximations and things like that. Uh, I'm not gonna talk on that today, but I'm really just focusing on these, these core operators. Um, so what does an operator look like mathematically? Um, so this is the 2D spectral element divergence. So the divergence, if you write it down mathematically, um, sorry, I should even be more precise. We're divergence in, we use generalized coordinates because we're, we have to find things on our spheres. If you use Cartesian coordinates, then you get either weird numerical artifacts. So um, a divergence is like the, you sum, take the partial derivatives and um, sum them up and there's some weighting terms. Um, discreetly, how we compute it is you do, uh, it's based on sort of a very, I guess the key idea is that what you end up with is you have these very small matrices, matrix multiplies. 
So here your indices, so your sum over your i's and your j's here are typically you know, somewhere between three and eight. So they're pretty small matrices. Um, you have to do a lot of them. Uh, and so you sort of do a multiply by matrix in one direction, you do a multiply by matrix by another direction. Um, it's so, yeah, think very small matrix multiplies is ultimately, in some sense, this is the problem I'm trying to solve. Um, and so D here, this matrix is very specific. It's the one that gives you a derivative. Um, so if you have a polynomial, so a derivative is a linear operator, and so you can write it as a matrix. Um, so there's a couple of challenges here to how we actually implement these. So first thing is that F here is not actually a field typically, it's something we compute from a field because um, we don't want to have to compute F here is typically a flux and it's F. Um, but you typically don't want to actually compute the flux and store it to memory, you want to, it's something you want to compute on the fly. And so the big thing is, you know, um, we want to minimize the amount of memory we're store reading and writing. Like that's ultimately, you know, a lot of these algorithms end up being sort of memory bound. So we want to limit the amount of data we're moving around. Um, and so how might you do this on a CPU? So um, it's going to look, I, this is actually very much based on a completely different library called Trixie, um, which is a very, very nice library. And, you know, I don't know if there's anyone here, but uh, it's a very fast C, traditional CFD type library for, um, and, uh, and that works on spectral elements and they, um, yeah. And so it was a good, very, I'm very grateful, especially having, you know, one of the nice things about open source is you can see how other people do things. Um, and this is typically, we use a very similar approach, but basically you do something like this. You have a, you iterate over elements and these are all the elements can be done in parallel. So we stick a thread, that threads macro there. Um, then you have a, you allocate some sort of temporary scratch space uh, where you do um, in this case, and then you do your matrix multiplies. Um, so this is just the, this is the, you do a matrix multiply in one direction, you do a matrix multiply in the other direction, and then you accumulate it um, into this work array. Um, and then at the end, before you, at the end of each element, you do, there's an additional divide by a Jacobian operation, J here, and then we store that to memory. So the idea is you have this sort of small scratch space and you use an MRA here because then it can be, um, yeah, it's a static object, it's all statically known. So the compiler is usually pretty able to optimize this out. So it's not getting written to main memory. It's just, it's all operating in hopefully somewhere in, internally. Um, so how do we do this in Klima Core? We use um, what I call, have started to call, I don't know if there's a good name for this, but basically I call them pseudo functions. So a pseudo function is basically a function you can't call. Um, so why do you want that? Well, so a gradient, you can't call a gradient on a scalar. That doesn't make sense. But it acts like a function when you stick it in a broadcast expression. Um, and so for example, here uh, we have a divergence operation. You can stick it in your, you define a divergence operator and then we can broadcast over a function. We can compose, we have a function f, we can apply a divergence to it and we can negate it and that gives us um, a divergence. Um, and why we want to do that is because then it lets us fuse this into more complicated expressions. So we can do the function, application and the operators all in one whole expression. Um, what makes this tricky is that it requires a lot of extra stuff beyond just the simple broadcast operations. Uh, and you know, we also then for finite difference scheme, we also support some boundary conditions which require some special branches to deal with those as well. Um, so as a quick example of what this looks like, um, so this is a shallow water equations which are sort of an approximate, you know, think of it as, a, as the name suggests, it's trying to approximate, assume you have some bunch of a limit if you have a, on a surface, you can uh, have some sort of, uh, assume you have like a very shallow channel, this is what a fluid might act like. Um, so it's a 2D, it's a 2D PDE. Uh, and the key thing, and so this is what the equations look like in mathematical form. And this is what we end up writing in our code. Um, so you have a divergence operator uh, in, on H and you have a curl and a cross product and a few extra things in there. And a, so you have a gradient and a curl operators um, and we just apply those directly and then you can infuse these into multiple expressions. <laughs> so how do we get all this to work? Um, and we have time, all right. Firstly, I have to get a quick digression into how Julia array broadcasting works. Um, and so if this uh, is one of the really nice things about Julia is that the, um, I think this is Matt Bellman's, uh, I, I have much credit to him. Uh, this is the, how broadcasting works is a completely extensible, extendable interface. Um, and we use it and um, it's very nice. So, the, but the core idea is basically, there's a function called broadcasted which construct, which sequentially builds up an expression tree from the leaves. So you start at the very endpoints and you sequentially call broadcasted and you build up a, uh, an expression tree um, from 
by sequentially calling on, on by recursive call, calling on arguments. Um, and this typically returns another object called a capital B broadcasted. Sometimes it, call it return other things. Um, where and where such that if you call get index on that, that then actually evaluates that expression recursively. So if you have multiple broadcasted, it just passes the get index down and then evaluates the expression. And it also has this style, which is something you can like metadata you can attach to say, okay, this is what I'm getting. Usually it's used for like the array type, you know, dimen array dimensionality, but you can use it for other things, as we're sure. Um, and then after you've done that, you then actually material. So you build up the expression, then you materialize. And so materialize has sort of two phases. One is some instantiate, which basically does some checking, make sure your axes are correct. And then it calls copy to, which basically does the actual work of calling all your functions, doing all those things, building up an array and um, you know, iterate. So iteration and uh, exactly. So what that actually looks like is something like this. You have a, so if you have a uh, expression like g of f of x, um, it essentially turns it into a for loop over each index. It calls get index on the first broadcasted of G, which recursively each itself calls broadcasted again. So this is sort of what the stack will look like, I guess, um, in the code at the time, which then calls get index of the actual array. Then it evaluates the F, evaluates G, and then stores it in Y. So, and this is all, this is how broadcasting works. Um, and it does move on to the next element. So, how do we make this work? Um, we do a few things. So the first thing is broadcasted uh, returns, if you have an operator, it returns a special thing called a spectral broadcasted or a stencil broadcasted, depending on types. Uh, we stick some styles in there so that the, it will, it knows that during the, as it, if you wrap another function around it, it knows, oh, I have to use a specific style, I know what's going on here. Um, and these take precedence and you know, we'll throw errors if you try and do conflicting things. Uh, but the core thing is uh, then we define a custom materialize operation. Um, and how the materialize works here is that we first iterate over the elements, but then if you, um, it does this e uh, extra resolve pass, which basically whenever you hit an operator, um, we immediately resolve the operator within the element and then um, turn that into an SRA, uh, which then, then, and then uh, pass that back up and let it go back to iteration. So how does this work? Um, Sorry, let's give it a bit of an explanation. So now we have a function y of g of an operator of f of x. So not too com reasonably complicated, but this is a typical, pretty typical thing we, we have in our code. Um, so we iterate now over each element, as I said. We call the first pass, does this pass called resolve operator, which will now call resolve operator on the first one. Um, it will call resolve operator on the second one, then resolve operator on the third one, and then it'll hit this. And so it goes, okay, I've got an array. I don't need to resolve that. So it goes back up to here, here where I hit my broadcasted, first broadcasted thing. So now, how does it resolve? Is a function, it goes, okay, I'm now hitting an operator, so I have to actually apply the, oper apply the operator I'm doing. Um, and so first thing it does is allocate this work array, so in this case, an M array. Uh, we now iterate over those, uh, we now, now we iterate over each node within that element, which will do something like this. So we'll call broadcasted again, then feed back into array, which will then feed back. So this looks similar to our thing, but now we do something special. We now then do this multiplication operation and we store that in there. We set, so we add the contribution to each element of that uh, matrix multiplication there. Um, I'm just doing the 1D here because the 2D is almost the same, but similar. Uh, and then we do that for the next one and we do that the next one and now we've done our small matrix multiplication. Okay, but for just for the operator and just in the, within that element and now the, it will first now convert this to an SRA. So basically the idea, as long as the MRA doesn't leave the scope of the function, it doesn't get, typically won't get allocated, doesn't cause it trigger an allocation. So as we pass an SRA up, which is completely static, it's an immutable object, it, um, it doesn't, yeah, there's no stack, there's no, typically no uh, memory allocations. And so this gets passed back up the, uh, back, up, back up the tree. Um, so we get out of the resolve operator in the piece now, and now we can just do get index, but because we've materialized this intermediate piece in this broadcast expression, we can now just access that directly. And so now we just fall back on the usual broadcasting machinery. And we can do that for the next element. And as I said, we were doing some parallel, we can stick a thread to that thread there, and so we can do each element by parallel. And what's particularly nice is that this lets us actually compose operators. So if you put a Laplacian operator, which is a divergence of a gradient, you can just do um, resolve operate, the resolve operator pass will just do exactly what you want it to. So we'll do a gradient, so convert gradient, um, 
then uh, materialize it into an SRA, then compute divergence, um, and then materialize that into an SRA, and then you just do your pass again. So this is how we can do sort of compo composable operators uh, in, in Julia. By, yeah, at a very high, with this very high level syntax, we provide a very efficient mechanism for doing operators. Okay, so how do we do this on GPUs? Um, completely different, no. Uh, so, I guess I'm, I'm not a GPU architecture person, but um, my heuristic explanation of GPUs give you, so what is a GPU? Basically it gives you lots of threads, so I use threads in quotes, but, um, but they're much less flexible. Um, and so basically how it works is rather than sort of writing code, like a for loop, you instead write a function called a kernel, which you then tell the GPU to go do this. And it will, a kernel is a function that sort of executed on a single, what they call a thread. Um, and how the, GP, how the GPU itself will work is it'll internally break that up into chunks. Um, CUDA calls this a warp, it's got every other one calls something else, but basically it operates on chunks which then operate in lockstep and then it'll do some fancy scheduling and there's multiple layers of this, but that's the road it is. You're writing something that will get to poll multiple times and maybe slightly asynchronous. However, there are two key features that we can leverage here that, that, turn, that make this interesting. Um, and you know, this has been, I'm not, there's nothing, this is, goes well back, this is like 15, you know, this is a, that we try and leverage here. But there's two things, we can synchronize threads. Um, so we can synchronize all, the, within a block we can synchronize all these threads. And there's, uh, we have access to a shared memory. So this is something that is basically memory that is accessible to all threads in that block. Um, but doesn't escape out, so it's not like it's not main memory. It's faster than main memory, but it's like sort of a temporary scratch space that it, that is actually shared. Um, and so the core idea we use here is basically a broadcast expression is a single CUDA kernel, which is, matches up with how CUDA, you know, a typical broadcasting works in, on a CUDA array, for example. We use one thread per node, so you know, one thread per element of matrix. So that's standard. But the key, th key idea is that any time we access node, any time we uh, have any internode access, so we have some sort of yeah, that sort of matrix multiply piece. We store all the inputs to a shared array, uh, and then we synchronize. Okay, so what does this look like? Um, so it's most, so instead of having an iteration over elements now, thank you, uh, instead of now iterating over having a for loop, we now specify the element index from this, what we call the block index, and we specify the index within each element as the uh, thread index. And this works, and, and now those block, within those, those threads in that block, I just operate sequentially. So they call get index on the broadcasted object, uh, call get index on the spectral spectra broadcasted object. Uh, now we do this, now whenever we hit a spectral broadcasted, now we have to do this resolve the operator. We uh, apply, call apply kernel operator, which basically now calls this, allocates our static shared, our sh shared memory. But instead of allocate, unlike the, CPU one where we did the, we allocated this scratch space on the outputs, this time we allocate on the inputs for reasons that will be sort of become apparent. Um, because we want to do this in parallel, you can't mutate multiple, if you're doing, this is sort of where the key thing becomes important is because what we, we have to do like multiple writes of the same space. And so you can't really have a, can't, we can't, if we, on the CPU one we had, we're doing the multiple writes sequentially, so we knew that it was, okay, it was safe to do. Whereas here, we have to do the multiple writes in the for loop, so we can't write to the shared memory from different threads. So it's all about controlling synchronization. So it requires us a bit of a different pattern. Um, now, that call we call get index on our broadcasted object, which then, you know, as before, material evaluates f of x basically. And we write, so what we end up doing is evaluating f of x and storing that into shared memory. Okay, now we synchronize threads. Why do we need to synchronize threads? because now all different threads are going to access that shared memory. So that's the core idea is basically we use shared memory as a scratch base that then the shared, that all those threads can, that, that different threads can now access. Um, so this is a fairly neat trick. This is not our trick, this goes, yeah. I mean, it's very similar to how, you know, this is, goes back to, I think the papers I found from like 2009 when people started doing spectral, you know, started doing this sort of code on GPUs. But, you know, the idea is you synchronize, the idea is you, yeah, anytime you have sort of these small multiply, multiplications, you synchronize the threat. You, a single write and then you synchronize. Um, and now you'd have a simple for loop where each thread now is just basically accessing each element of that shared memory. So they sequentially and they do that. Again, we do a little matrix multiply there and then we write that to G and then now we go back. And so we go, okay, now we, we still got to call this get index. 
but now we can just, the get indexing just pull that value from the, it has, yeah, so we've built up the result of that operator and now we can keep going forward, keep going forward. And so each thread is just, the get index is still just returning a single value, but it did this little shared memory piece inside itself. And now we can write to values. Um, and as I mentioned before, this is all being done in parallel. Each element can be operated, be scheduled, the CPU, the GPU will typically thread, schedule these GPU, these operations. It may mix them up, it may stop doing them, whatever. But the idea is each element is completely independent. Um, and so this is how we basically have implemented Clima Core GPU support. Um, so the main trick is we compose, that as, as with the CPU code, we can compose multiple operators. So every time you have an operator, it's a shared array, uh, shared, you know, shared memory, and a synchronize. And this works and it provides, and we, yeah, and this, so we actually were able to get exactly the same, so the same broadcast expression is very different code parts under the hood, but is able to operate on uh, the CPU and GPU. We can provide similar, this, we do a similar thing for finding difference operators. Um, that's a bit simpler with some redundant operations. We have to look into leveraging shared memory. And so as a result, we got this uh, atmosphere model, basically was, we got, which was a, in, a, in a package called Clean Atmos, now works on a GPU with basically remarkably few code changes. I think we only had to change a handful of lines um, and basically had every, and the entire model now runs on the GPU on the device. So there's no copying to and from host memory um, except for basically IO. Uh, yeah, so I guess the core summary is that you can, you know, we, GPU and CPU code can require very different algorithms underneath. Like that's just the nature of it. Um, but we can make, access, make them accessible using a common interface Broadcasting is exceptionally flexible, um, and it's a, in some sense, a DSL without macros. Um, I didn't talk, there's a lot of optimization we can still do here. We can group multiple elements, different memory layouts, et cetera, and we can map, that gets the core idea. But I am very grateful to the efforts of the Julia GPU team, um, who, you know, we frequently cause some issues, but um, yeah, it's a really, it's a testament to the amount of effort that, and the compilers, compiler writers have done that we can actually do this, um, you know. So those functions are often just like random functions people have written that do all sorts of complicated things and they just run natively on the GPU. So, thank you. Sorry, I'm giving the next talk as well, sorry. Yes, great. Okay, so the question is, from a strategy point of view, what's the difference between optimizing a CPU code and a GPU code? Um, I think you probably do need, like they're very, some things are very important the same. So like at a high level, you know, you don't want to be allocating memory, you know, new value. So you have to, at a high level, you have to want to structure that code the same. Um, beyond that, I think it's, we, I mean, we went from the outset so we wrote the CPU code first, but we, had, we wrote the CPU code with a vision that we, we wanted to have the GPU support, add GPU support. And so it was very clearly, we designed a lot of the backing infrastructure with the GPU support eventually in mind. Um, that, you know, particularly how we laid out stuff in memory, that's some, something that you need to, you know, can become very important. Um, and, but, you know, and, you know, sort of operations and the broadcasting machine itself was designed in a way that we wanted to, you know, how can we parallelize things in a way that is amenable to GPU parallelism? Um, and then a lot of the nuts and bolts of it is, it's different. I mean, there's some, you know, in some sense, those functions that we call within the, like within the broadcasting expressions, if they're, they have to be fast on a CPU for them to be fast on, at all fast on a GPU. So, you know, you can't be doing like ridiculous, you know, you can't be doing like lookup tables, huge, really complicated lookup tables or like accessing yeah, we can't access main memory from the, those functions because they won't run on a GPU at all. But if they're doing really complicated thing, you know, yeah, those sorts of things, yeah, yeah. So a lot of stuff carries over. Stefan. What is it, I mean, when you switch from using CPU to GPU, what, you know, how does that change? Is it like a at the top or? This is, an excellent question, and one we don't have a great solution for. Currently, we just call, we have a, we just literally call CUDA.available. Um, 
which is not the best. Um, so it means we have to load the whole CUDA package to do it, to any, you know, even on a CPU. Um, and we just have like an environmental override to say, we assume that you want to use CUDA if you have a device, which may not be the case if you've just got like a running a laptop and you have a dinky little CPU, GPU. Um, but yeah, have Becker made into that would be fantastic. So yeah, this is, I think that's something we don't have a good solution for yet. Right. Yes. Oh yeah, sorry. Yeah. And you're mic'd up, so you don't have to okay. how does that also uh, interact with something like FDI when you have like multiple GPUs and I imagine at some point you have a uh, node that needs stuff that is on a separate GPU and yeah. that communication. So I didn't mention that at all. We do yeah, so the question was how does this interact with something like MPI, um, which for distributed parallelism. Uh, we it actually we have MPI, yeah, we support MPI and GP, multi, like GPU aware MPI. Um, so the short answer is nothing I talked about there actually involves MPI at all. Spectral elements is all within local. The where the MPI comes in is the communication, so the DSS or those numerical flux operations. And yes, yeah, at the moment they're sort of specially written up. We have a completely different code paths for CPU and GPU, but the function is the same. So the user, the function, the user code is do this. Um, yeah. Right. Thank you, Simon.